Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm the author of the Tanyuan Academy series, and this is English Nerd. So I'm continuing the series about my favorite poems today with Gerard Manley Hopkins' Carrie and Comfort, which is not exactly a hidden gem. It's one that does tend to come up from time to time, but not often enough, I say. So I'm going to break that down for you right here. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick scan of Carrie and Comfort. It's another one of those underrated sort of poems by somebody who is really well known for other things. Um, so this is Carrie and Comfort by Gerard Manley Hopkins, one of my favorite poems. So just starting, starting from the top. Not, I'll not carry in comfort, despair, not feast on thee. So just taking that first line, I mean, even, even observing the entire thing, there's no really clear meter or rhyme, although there is a, a very intentional beat we'll find out later on. Um, instead, what we get is all these, all these breaks, all these pauses. Um, you call these, if you're being fancy, sejuras. So a sejura is just a break in a line of poetry. So if you've read Beowulf or something like that, it's literally just a white space in between sections of a line. Here it's it's going to be commas and dashes and things like that. So we have a ton of sejuras. Not, I'll not carry in comfort, despair, not feast on thee. And so step one when you're when you're analyzing poetry is to point out these things. Step two is to figure out why that actually fits. And in this case, we have this desperation. I mean, it starts out with the word not, and then there's immediately a pause. And he starts again, I'll not carry in comfort. It's almost like he's he's arguing with this, um, this personified despair. We can tell it's personified because one, he's arguing with it, and two, it's capitalized. And so he has this desperation. He wants to give in to despair. He calls it carrion comfort, which of course is the name of the, uh, well, the name that's been given to this poem. Carrion, in case you're unaware, is, is the, well, it's the flesh of dead animals. And so it's like what scavengers would go and eat. And so there's this comfort, but it's this, this dead kind of uh, leftover second best kind of comfort in despair. So he wants to give into this. He's fighting against it. He's refusing to feast on this comfort that isn't true comfort. I mean, comfort's not capitalized, but despair is. That tells us something. So next line, not untwist, slack they may be, these last strands of man in me, or most weary cry, I can no more, I can Okay, so there's a lot here, and I'm not going to unpack the entire thing, but I'll, we'll talk about a couple things. So with um, Gerard Manley Hopkins, you have this um, these accents sometimes. He was playing a lot with different types of meter and, and where he wanted people to focus their, their attention in the line. And so here, normally you'd read it, in me or most weary cry, I can no more. But he really wanted that focus on or... And I'm not going to untwist these last strands of man in me or cry I can no more. He's, he's arguing once again with this really strenuous tone. So he's not going to take what there is within him and, and uh, give up. Instead, he says, I can. But that leads into the next line. We have some repetition throughout here. I'll not, I'll not. I can, can something. Um, we get the sense with this repetition that it's not necessarily the kind of repetition that you need to focus on the right thing. It's it's a kind of repetition that you have when you're trying to formulate your thoughts and you just end up backtracking and trying again with, with new wording. So, I can, can something, hope, wish day come, not choose, not to be. I can not choose not to be. I mean, all of these, all of these nots, not, I'll not, not untwist, not choose, not to be. There's all this negative diction here, all this negative language, all the repetition of not. And even as he's fighting against despair, he keeps using all this negative language. Um, not choose, not to be is about the most passive way that you can say, I 
can stay alive and, and not give in to despair uh, that I could possibly think of. But ah, but oh thou terrible, why wouldst thou rude on me thy ring-world right foot rock? <laughs> Lay a lion limb against me, scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones, and fan oh in turns of tempest me heaped there, me frantic to avoid thee and flee. Okay, there's a lot there. And just like before, we're not going to talk about every possible thing. Um, but once again, we have, but uh, oh thou terrible, why wouldst thou? So he's he's still directly addressing, it seems like he's addressing despair, but then we, we start to see a little shift in the way that he's talking about. He's talking about despair. So why wouldst thou root on me thy ring world right foot rock? So he's using very Anglo-Saxon kind of words here. It's something that, that Hopkins liked to do rather than making it more Frenchified and fancy sounding. He wanted something that was that was meaty and chewy, and that line definitely is. It's really hard to say. But is he talking here about despair? How it rings the world? How it rocks the world with its foot? Um, the the language seems to seems to shift a little bit toward, um, as we'll see later on, toward God Himself, and so there's this this kind of overlapping way of looking at the poem where you can you can read it with him referencing despair but you can also read it as he's having this dialogue with God and I think that's a very legitimate way of looking at this poem especially considering that Hopkins was a very religious person and was having the this profound depression at this at the time in his life when he was writing this poem so why would you do this to me? Why would you lay a lion limb against me? This is a uh, reference both to God as, you know, the Lion of Judah. There, There's definitely a connection between a lion and God. Just think Aslan from, from the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, but there's also this sense that, that whatever it is is at the top of the food chain and I'm at the bottom with this um, carrion. That's, that's my option here. Scan with dark, some devouring eyes, my bruised bones why would you do this why would you why would you in turns of tempest fan me heaped there me frantic to avoid the and flee here we have another inverted word order why would you fan me heaped there me frantic um it is correct to have me instead of i but it it sounds uncomfortable it, it sounds like shoehorned in there or something and i think that might refer back to the way that the narrator, in this case I think we can fairly say Hopkins, but the narrator is feeling not in the right, um, the right place himself. Um, it just, he feels, he feels awkward and, and not in the right order. Um, nothing in this, in this section has been straightforward. Instead, everything is just this desperation and, and pain. Okay, so then we get to the second stanza. Why? It's a great way to open a open a stanza, and it it's a it's a beautiful expression of this kind of despair as well. You know why? Why is this happening to me? That my chaff might fly, my grain lie sheer and clear. Um, I mean, I put in a question mark at the end of that, but there is just a period. Here, the image that he has is. One, a, a biblical image of the threshing floor where the chaff, the bad stuff, goes flying away and the grain, the good, uh, remains, or the good within a person, the good people. Um, so is this all happening as sort of a test to separate the, the bad from the good? That's, that's his, his assumption here. Nay, in all that toil, that coil since seems, I kissed the rod, hand rather, my heart, low, lapped strength, tol stole joy, would laugh, cheer. There's another one of those, those accents where you're supposed to really emphasize that line. Okay, so he, here he says, I, I, I don't know. So nay is, is the answer to this kind of implied question. Is it this? Is that why this is happening to me? Um, in all that toil, that coil... Here, I don't, I'm not sure what he means by coil. My association with it would be Hamlet, the mortal coil. Um, you know, being sort of trapped in your own body, which seems to fit just fine. Uh, since seems, I kissed the rod. So here he's 
referring to his, his allegiance. Um, when you kiss the rod, you kiss the hand, he's referring to allegiance to someone higher. So this is another reference to God, it seems to me. Um, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They're supposed to. That's um, from Psalm Psalm 23. But here he says, you know, I, I pledged my allegiance, it seems. He uses parentheses in a couple really important places here. I thought, I, it seems like I... I showed my allegiance, I kissed the rod, the instrument of, of discipline, hand rather, he, he adjusts his, his answer and says, well, no, it wasn't just, it wasn't just the rules, the discipline, it was, um, you know, the person, the, the hand that I, that I kissed to show my allegiance, and my heart, lo, lapped strength, stole joy, would laugh, cheer, so there was, there was good, happiness and all of that, you know, like, I, I should be, I should be set. Cheer whom, though, is the next question. This one's full of questions. This, this stanza, more so than this one, um, well, I don't know, we have, we have quite a few at the end. He's just, he's full of questions. <laughs> cheer whom, though? If he's cheering, um, at his allegiance with God, who is he cheering? What is he cheering? The hero whose heaven handling flung me, foot trod me, or me that fought him? Oh, which one? Is it each one? Ooh, so here's where it gets really juicy. So he says, who, who am I cheering? Is it the hero who's, heaven hand, who's heaven handling flung me? So he's, he's saying, was I cheering God? Was I cheering Christ? The hero? The one who should be cheered? But, who's, but who flung me into this situation? Who trod me down? Um, referencing that, that foot, you know, rocking the world there. Here we have him trotting the, um, the narrator down. So did I cheer the one who was against me, essentially? Um, at least is in this moment, feels like he is, or me that fought him. So this is, this is loaded language. He says, I'm fighting against God himself. Oh, which one? Did I cheer on me? Did I cheer on God? Whose side am I even on? Um, is it each one? Here, there's there's definitely uh, a reference for the for the, the the Christian people who are reading this to uh, Israel fighting with the the angel um, in the desert and and wrestling with uh, God Himself, and that is actually referenced more closely in the final lines, um, which are some of my favorites. So that night, that year. Of now done darkness, I wretch lay wrestling with my God, my God. Okay, so let's take this last line. I mean, we, we took the first line pretty carefully. Let's take the last line pretty carefully. It's a good rule of thumb. So that night, that year, of now done darkness, I I wretch. Okay, lay wrestling. Here we don't. We would normally have commas separating this out. You know, just to say that this. This word references I, but when you don't have commas, you don't, you don't use commas if you don't need them. Or in other words, if the the word is so essential to the meaning of the sentence that you can't afford to have it separated out. And so here I think that's what he's doing. He's associating, associating himself so closely with this idea of being wretched that he doesn't even need the commas. He obviously plays a lot with with grammar and, and whatnot and to get his point across, so I think that that's fair to say. I wretchedly wrestling, so this idea of wrestling with God goes back to, to Israel in the desert in Genesis. I wretchedly wrestling with my God, my God. I love this ending because we have in parentheses, my God, exclamation point, and then he, it's like he's realizing, I am wrestling with God himself. What am I doing? There's this, this, uh, it's just an exclamation. Oh my God, it's, it's God that I'm wrestling against. You know, is there, you know, what have I, what have I been doing? Am I focused on the right things? And they're also here with my God, my God. It's a clear allusion to Christ on the cross. clear allusion to Christ on the cross. His, his, some of his final words are, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Very famously. And so here he's, he's wrestling with God, 
but there's also this association with God, this identification with Christ in his, in his final suffering on the cross. I mean, here, even when he's deciding, who am I cheering on? Is it, is it him? Is it me? Oh, which one? Is it each one? There's something about how God, even in this moment where he's fighting against despair, is so close to him that there's this, uh, this association, this very close association between the two people, so much so that their, some of their final words are the same final words. And we don't get, we don't get a nice conclusion to this because I don't think um, the narrator or Hopkins felt that any sort of conclusion to this. Really, the whole thing is just a fight and then kind of a realization, but not a conclusion um, to the to the problem of despair. But I think this is a really excellently done, unusual kind of poem. Um, I tend to like religious poetry when it is surprising and honest, and I think this is definitely surprising and honest. So there you go. A quick look at Carrie and Comfort by Gerard Manley Hopkins. All right, I hope you learned something and that you appreciate this poem a little bit more than you did when you first came. So let me know what your favorite poems are down below. Like this video if you like it, and don't forget to subscribe for more English nerdy goodness. All right, I'll see you on Monday. Bye.